Welcome back to a special UNC basketball podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you're checking us out on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated, I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones. And joining me is our very own David Sisk, longtime AAU college high school coach. He's been around sport for a long time, and he has a pretty fair idea of how a lot of these coaching hires and maneuverings and the thinking behind the scenes goes. So David and I are going to jump into that with Hubert Davis today announced as North Carolina's new head coach, replacing Roy Williams. Jacob and I did a podcast earlier about immediate reactions. David and I are going to go a little bit different direction, although I'm not sure because I think organic is the way to go, David. Yeah, and I think everything that we'll talk, of course, I think we do good piggybacking off each other and who knows which direction we'll go. But uh, we had a pretty good discussion yesterday where, you know, we went down a lot of rabbit holes. So. Yeah. Well, in part of that discussion, we thought about doing a podcast uh, last night about it, but kind of pulled back at the last minute. Part of it was because I had to give my wife a few hours on Easter and we had someone over. So I decided, you know what, I'm not going to push push it on that one. I, I asked for a lot from her and this isn't the day to ask for anymore because I'd already worked like eight hours. So uh, one of the things we wanted to discuss was about programs, big time programs, like the major ones, the ones that have tradition and history and, and immense culture hiring from within and and it was a pretty I, in a way I wish we could take the text chat and just kind of pop it up in a piece I think people would find it interesting but I'm gonna let you kind of go with it from there and and we'll just kind of see where this takes us because North Carolina did hire Hubert Davis from within and before you respond you go back to 1952 when Frank McGuire was hired when Dean Smith came on board he was already on Frank McGuire's staff when Smith retired in 98, Bill Guthridge was Dean's right-hand man for a long time. He was already on staff. Then they brought in Matt Doherty, who was part of the Carolina program, was on Roy's staff for a long time, one-year head coach at Notre Dame. Then they brought back Roy. Hubert is hired from within. So five hires since 1952, three from within. One guy had one year of head coaching experience after leaving a form of the family. And then, of course, there was Roy coming back. So if there's ever a school that is comfortable – hiring from within it is North Carolina you stole all my lines I don't have anything left I cast over <laughs> wow. uh 69 years you know when, when Dean came in from Kansas he was an assistant coach under Frank McGuire for four years so you know the tree basically started in 1956 and uh it's grown you know trees can grow in 69 years they get big so, um, you know, it's branched out, as you said, uh, and there were so many names that they started going down here that I've heard today, even if, as possible individuals who were interviewed, Wes Miller, Jerry Stackhouse, King Rice, you know, you, you, you hear different names from that tree. Uh, and, and we had spoken yesterday and it, it really became kind of more evident that this might be the, the road that they would go down. Um, and, and then we find out, you know, that Roy really was very comfortable with Hubert Davis taking over. But there's a couple things. Number one, like we said, the North Carolina hiring within, and that's huge. Um, a lot of places say they do it, but if you'll look and you'll compare what North Carolina does now, Nobody else. You know, Nebraska football went that way for a while, and then they fired Solich, and Michigan had Rich Rodriguez slip in. And you could say maybe Ohio State from staying in the state with Trestle and Urban Meyer, but those weren't Ohio State guys. They were Ohio guys. And it would be probably about like North Carolina hiring Rick Barnes, you know, or, or somebody like that. That, that was so, a cuss word to some Carolina fans. I understand that, but, but you know what I mean, just a yeah, guy from North true. Carolina. So, um, of Danny Manning or somebody, I don't know. So, um, North Carolina, it's one thing to say it. North Carolina has lived that tree and, you know, that family. And it means something. It probably, you know this as well as anybody, Andrew, you could explain it a lot better than me. That tree and that family probably met more Roy Williams than does anybody. So, uh, you know, that was huge to him. He had to say so. So, you could, so it made a lot of sense that it would go that route the more you looked at it. And then if you look at what I call the Mount Rushmore hires, 
And Dick Vitale calls it the Mount Rushmore of coaches uh, with Dean Smith, with Roy Williams, with, with Bobby Knight and Coach K. And, but you look at the legendary coaches and you throw in Wooden and Rupp. And, and so Wooden's really about the only guy with Gene Barto that didn't hire, you know, were the assistant coach. Um, if you look, uh, start out with Rupp. Rupp goes Joe B. Hall, who was his assistant. Um, Bobby Knight goes Mike Davis. Um, and then you go from, as you said, with Dean Smith with Bill Guthridge. So, uh, and even if you get in, and I don't know at that time if you would even consider Roy at that time when he left Kansas in that company, but Bill Self was at Kansas when Larry Brown was there. So, like I said, I, I think on, in the basketball circles, programs are comfortable hiring from within, from people that know that program. There's something to be said about knowing the program when it's not just any other one. And uh, it also, uh, you know, feeling that, that there's somebody there that knows it and that are qualified and you hire within that tree. And more times than not, even besides North, North Carolina, programs that really care about basketball, that's kind of the direction they've taken. How important, and a lot of people are, because we're about, what time is it now? We're about four and a half hours removed from this really kind of breaking out. And everybody, we got our confirmation, we ran our story. And I have heard from quite a few people asking why. Why would they go hire a 50-year-old coach who's never coached before? And, I, and I'm not trying to justify what I've tried to do with the column I wrote on our message boards and the podcast with Jacob, and I'll do it some here, is just try to explain it. <clears throat> I, I, it's not my job to just to validate it or not. That'll happen in the next few years when Hubert's teams take the court, and we'll see how they do. I'm trying to understand how Carolina got to this point. And when you're in a program like this, it's not, I'm not going to disparage any of the programs out there. Let's say you know, Mississippi State doesn't have the same culture. Iowa State doesn't have the same culture. So they want to go get the best basketball coach. They think you can do a job for them. There's a different dynamic when you're in North Carolina. There's a, and there was at one time a different dynamic in Kentucky. You know, Indiana brought back Mike Woodson, who hadn't been, on, hadn't been around a college game in 40 years, but he's an Indiana guy. He's one of the best players they ever had, a long time in the NBA. And then they're bringing back Dane Fife to be on his staff. So there's something different about these kinds of programs that are culture programs. And culture is so important, not just on the campus and within the walls of the basketball offices, but among the fans as well. And, and they play for something a little different. I'm going to sidebar for a second. Somebody asked me the other day, how can UCLA as an 11 seed do this? And I said, because those kids went to UCLA knowing they were going to play for something a little bit different because of what's on the front of their chest. That's why Kentucky is an eight seed plays in a title game a few years ago. Carolina is a nine seed in 2000 gets to a final four. Kentucky is an 11 seed. Darner got to a national title game. When you play in those programs, you're playing for something different. There's a little different spur that they experience and maybe they, and kids do in other programs. So when you're looking at hiring somebody like this, David, those nine years that Hubert sat a couple of seats down from Roy, how much bigger do you think that really is? And maybe a lot of people understand, especially <clears throat> with respect to giving him the keys to something like this. Um, I think there's a trust. I think Roy has to see in just everyday activity that, yeah, he's up to this. I think, you know, if you're the head coach, because as we said, we felt like Roy had that endorsement for Hubert Davis. Uh, certainly didn't discourage it. Well, uh, I, so, I guarantee he did, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, here's the thing with, with that Hubert Davis has got to realize. I've been through this myself. I told you, I took over a high school basketball program straight off the state championship with coach had won over 700 games. And the pressure that Royal feel compared to what I, from what Hubert will feel rather compared to what I felt was, it's going to be astronomically more. Um, but he's got to be himself. He can't be, and that's the thing. He can't be, um, Roy Williams. He can't be Dean Smith. He's got to be Hubert Davis. Uh, and once he does that, I'm, I'm, I, I'm interested to see what does he take from Pat Riley? What's he take from 
uh, Rick Carlisle? What's he take from Stan Van Gundy? What does he take from those guys and put it into what he does? Uh, and then mix that into what he may take from what Roy Williams done. So it's, that's going to be interesting. And I think just all those experiences, uh, everybody's unique. And it makes Hubert Davis a unique hire, and it makes Hubert uh, Davis, uh, I think, what he brings to the table, it brings that unique. And, and I'm interested to see what it is. You've covered recruiting for a while. You also cover recruiting for Kentucky. You, you know a ton of college coaches. You know pro guys. <clears throat> From your vantage point, outside looking in, what, what is the perception of the Carolina basketball family? Not the program, but the family. And how do you think quietly people around the sport are going to respond to this hiring? I, I don't think there's any way you could knock the, the family part of it. Um, I've never heard any criticism of it. And, you know, not all do it that way. But um, I think when you're in college sports, you know, that's huge. And I will say that there's a difference. I think if there's two, programs that you hear family about or you always hear the Michigan man and the perception's been with Michigan that man they got to get outside of that and think outside of the box but you think of Michigan uh they've been chasing Ohio State for 20 years or longer and they've not had a success and if you look at North Carolina well, COVID and everything, it seems like a million years ago, but it's not. I mean, North Carolina won, you know, they won a national championship and could have won two less than five years. So um, you can't you can't knock that at all. I think with Hubert's hire, I think a lot of it, and maybe they don't understand the dynamic. And what I mean by that, I think you're going to have you, this hire. Let's face it, this hire is going to take some criticism across the country. And really, North Carolina fans don't need to get upset by that because most people have said, hey, if this is not the number one job in the country, it ain't far down the list. So that job could demand basically whoever they wanted. If they really wanted to go after a Mark Few or a Tony Bennett or whoever, okay, that they feel like North Carolina could get that guy. Uh, so I think any knock on the Hubert Davis hire is going to be because the North Carolina program is, is just, it's considered with such prestige. So like I said, don't take that as a slap. Um, but you're going to hear some of that, I think, simply because, like I said, uh, a coach who's not been a head coach yet coming into a situation like that. But it was the same with Mike Woodson, you know, at, at Indiana. That's a prestigious job. You hear that. So I think anybody that hires a coach that doesn't necessarily have that experience, we talked about it before this, Dabo Sweeney goes to Clemson. You know, something like that's going to take all kinds of criticism. And you can take – Jawan Howard took it. Yeah. You know, Jawan Howard goes to Michigan two years ago, and they're like, man, this guy, he's never recruited. He don't know anything about – I mean, he coached the NBA, yeah. You know, he's got NBA experience. But, man, this is a different thing. NBA guys don't like to grind and recruit the way they do in college. Well, guess what? He's a, Two years later, he's the number one seed. He's got the number one recruiting class in the country. So – you can't, you know, it, there, there's always going to be the naysayers. You can't, you just can't go with that. Hubert's not, don't worry about it and just do your thing and be Hubert Davis. That'd be my advice. When you think about his associations, the many that he's had, and just the idea of playing for Dean and Pat Riley and Larry Brown and coaching with Roy, basically for the last 30 some odd years, he has been around among the greatest minds in the sport at the collegiate and professional level. You know, I mean, I know you don't know who you were. I know you're not in that room right now, weren't today and that kind of stuff. But how much do you think a guy like him, this smart guy, can soak in for being around so many amazing people and kind of juxtapose a little bit with a lot of your experiences 
all the different people you've been around, how much you take from this guy and how much you take from that guy. I know you said you're kind of curious how he's going to do things, but how much can a guy like that learn from being around so many brilliant basketball minds? I go back to Jawan Howard. Jawan Howard came out of that Miami Heat tree. And if you look at what he does compared to what uh, the Miami Heat runs with their offense, all the side pistol stuff, all the pin down screens into the ball screens and stuff that they do. I mean, you can see uh, Pat Riley and the Miami Heat uh, on down. You can see their fingerprints all over it. Uh, and, and now, if you watch them, they watch them in the tournament, Michigan, very, very patient. So it's not like he stole it and took it with him. He had to adapt that to his talent into a college game. And I, I think that's what intel, very intelligent individuals do, and they're able to take all that stuff. I think more than anything, I think all the guys know X's and O's. I don't think there's – and you hear say people say, well, this guy just rolls the balls out. I guarantee you the guys that roll the balls out, knows more basketball and we've all forgot, you know, so, so, or, or yeah. forgotten more than we know or whatever it is. You know, I, guy, sound like, guy I, Lewis, sound like George, I sound like George Bush, fool me once, fool me twice. But, but anyway, they, they've forgotten more than we know. So um, here's the thing that I think they take from it. He learned about recruiting from Roy. I guarantee you learned a lot about that. It's going to be huge. And the other thing is, I think the thing you learn is how to deal with people, you know, and how to coach a team. I know this. I heard Skip Holt say one time that his dad told him, if you want to be a coach, he said, here's the thing. You better learn how to deal with crisis, crisis management. That's the most important thing I tell you. He said, because every day there's going to be a crisis on that team with some player. Now, basketball, you don't have 85 players, but you're going to run into this stuff. You, can you handle the moment? Can you be, bring your team together, your players together? Like you said, can you motivate? Can you make them cohesive? But just, man, how do you handle drama? Because there's going to be plenty of it. So there's so much more that you can take from it than, than X's and O's. So what do you think of the hire? I think it made sense. I really do. Like I said, I go back to it and look, it made sense. And we talked, we ran by so many scenarios. Yeah, we did. Okay. Yesterday. Now let's oh, go in the tree and we'll run by some of the stuff we said. Okay. I thought there was a faction of North Carolina, some that wanted Miller, some that wanted Davis, some that wanted Stackhouse. And if they became vocal, we talked about when does, 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 uh, you know, the athletic director and everybody involved, when do they look at this and say, well, man, we've got all these factions at war tearing against each other. Let's go outside. We might as well. That never happened, you know, and that was good. It seems like it was clean and it seems like the hire was done quickly. It was done decisively. Everybody's on board. So that's great. Um, and, and we talked about, you know, the, the hiring within and all that. But let's go outside just a minute. Yeah. Let's throw names. And you hear Brad Stevens' name out there of everybody. Well, the thing is, Brad Stevens, you can't sit right now. And, and let me just say why I would eliminate guys, because I've, I've got to be careful. I don't want to make this sound like – I'm eliminating guys in the last straw is Hubert Davis. I'm not. Yes, I understand. I, I, and I hope and everybody listening, yeah. and everybody listening, remember what he just said. Yeah, I'm, I'm careful qualified. about that. I am not, I'm not doing that. But I'm just saying, let's be realistic. People, I, I'm going to chop down why they would say other people, well, you've got to hire Brad Stevens. Well, you can't have Brad Stevens because especially with a transfer portal and you're going to have to re-recruit guys on your roster now, and you may offer some guys in this 2021 class that you need, I'm thinking of one particularly, you can't go and say, okay, look, we're going to wait till the end of April or whenever, 1st of May, 
when the season's over, and then we'll make that move. You can't – it would be deadly to the program. Yeah. What Hubert Davis brings to – it solidifies to me next season. I believe the smoothest transition. What if you make a hire and Caleb Love says, I'm out? Yeah. Armando Baycott says, I'm out. And for the record, let me jump in for a second. Our understanding is that the mass exodus that a lot of people projected wasn't going to happen. Manly and Miller leaving were not, I mean, they'd, fin- they were, they'd finished their four years. They weren't going to be in the program. So that wasn't an issue. So they lost one guy as a transfer and one, is, one going pro. Everyone else was planning on coming back before the Roy announcement. So just to clarify, they, they weren't going to have any more uh, kids leave. But what you're saying, just so people understand, is you go outside the family, bring somebody, maybe that precipitates, a, a, inspires some yeah. kids. And I think this is, this is the, the smoothest bridge, you know, to next year. I think it's the best chance of people playing, I, of staying. I think the best team you could possibly put on the floor next year is with Hubert Davis, number one. Number two. What if you hire Brad Stevens, Jay Wright, Mark Few? Those guys are those guys are not going to leave. And here, here, here's the reason. Okay, Mark Few can win a championship of Gonzaga, and he's got a chance, I think, to go to the Final Four every year. Tony Bennett has a chance to go to the Final Four every year. I never understood why his name was thrown out there by people. Yeah. That's, that was absurd. Jay Wright has that opportunity. So here's the situation. If you do that, if you have that opportunity, you've got what you want there. Now, if you're a Chris Beard and you're at Texas Tech, I think maybe once every 10 years you might have a shot at Texas Tech. It makes sense you would go to greener pastures. but And he did by going to Texas Tech. Yeah, exactly. Now, he may be at a place now where he's got a shot. But – Villanova, Virginia, Gonzaga, they've got a lot to offer where they're at. So none of that stuff made sense. So Hubert solidifies that for next year. Okay, but let me ask you this. What if they would have hired Tony Bennett? Okay, the players leave, right? He struggles. Takes two or three classes to put this together. How long's the honeymoon? And are they going to take – and let me tell you, Ask Rich Rodriguez, ask Bill Curry, uh, ask um, the defensive coordinator they hired at Nebraska after they got rid of Solich. You know, he won like nine games, like four or five years in a row, and the, the one from LSU, and they got rid yeah, of him. I know you're talking about. <clears throat> yeah. And, and it's, so anyway. He was LSU this past year. Yeah. So ask these guys. Yeah, he was defensive coordinator at LSU last year. Ask these guys that come in outside of the family and it doesn't work right off the bat. It turns out to be a disaster. Yeah. It's so, very little patience. Yeah. So I think now I'm being careful where I put this. Yes. It's safe on the short term, but I think it's smart on the long term and I don't have a problem with it. And I'll say this for any hire, let it play out. Yeah. We talked about this beforehand. If they would have hired Red R back, I would have said, let it play out. We won't know. Because people ask me all the time, they're like, man, what? This is a great hire. Texas hired Chris Beard. Isn't that a great hire? I don't know. Man, I thought Shaka Smart was. Yeah. If you would have told me five, six years ago, and I would have got caught in a trout, I would let Shaka Smarlow win a national championship Texas win in five years. Well, Didn't Indiana win the press conference when they hired Archie Miller? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Good. So, And then you have some that you'll never think would make it. Why did they hire this guy? And they win huge. They're, they're, they're huge. They win big. So, you know, just – I would say I would say the same thing with Hubert Davis that I would say with Roy Williams, or if I hired Dean Smith or whoever. Let's let it play out. Let's see what happens in a couple of years. Support him, okay? Uh, don't bad mouth him. Don't try to run him off the first game he loses. It's like the old story that Barry Switzer told when he took over the job at Oklahoma and he won his first 27 games. I think it was at Oklahoma, and then they lost to somebody. 
and some guy called in at the, at the Oklahoma City newspaper, and he said, I knew if we hired that SOB, he'd lose a game every three years. Don't be that guy, okay? Don't be that guy. That's great stuff. So what do you remember from Hubert as a player? I remember him as being a guy who had a beautiful jump shot, who could glide. He had great hang time. A uh, guy who came in from Lake Braddock High School. Uh, by the way, attended the high, attended Lake Braddock when Mia Hamm was also there at school. That's in Burke, Virginia, which is near where I grew up. In fact, I, I told everybody, I told Jacob in a podcast earlier, I actually played football game against Lake Braddock High School. Um, he was unheralded, but he made himself a player. And a lot of people thought Roy was leaning toward West because he said some stuff about West lately. And even in his retirement press conference, he, he kind of went out of his way to talk about West being a self-made player and maybe coming the closest to reaching his potential of anyone he ever coached. Well, he never coached Hubert because he left to go to Kansas and Hubert came in for the 80-89 season as a freshman. But I would say that Hubert Davis came awfully close to reaching his potential as well because nobody thought he would be a regular contributor in North Carolina. He ended up playing 12 years in the NBA and is the number two, number three all-time three-point shooter in league history. He had a beautiful release, just a gorgeous shooter. So what do you remember about Hubert, the player in college and later on in the NBA? Well, I agree with you what you said, and I think it on both levels, it talks about his perseverance and his toughness. And aren't those the guys that you hire? Yeah. The tough guys. And I look at him as a tough guy. You know, I live close enough to Alabama to where you hear stories all the time about how Bear Bryant played with a broken leg, you know, and Shug Jordan was at Auburn and he went and fought. Uh, he was on at Normandy and then he volunteered after that got done. He volunteered to go into the Pacific theater and he, he fought at Normandy. If I'm not mistaken, he was at Iwo Jima too. So those, you know, and, and was a legendary coach at Auburn. Those are the tough guys that we kind of romanticize. We like our coaches tough. That's what we like. But he really did. He was kind of an overachiever, better at North Carolina than anybody thought. Um, like you said, great jump shot. We thought about him at that time, maybe a really solid guy could shoot the ball which tells you what, maybe a little bit of finesse. Well, he goes to New York and plays with Van Gundy in that group. And if you'll remember those guys that were on that team, Patrick Ewing, John Starks, uh, Charles Oakley. <laughs> my favorite, my one of my favorite groups of all time, I was a huge Knicks fan in the 90s. And, but that was the most physical basketball in history it was yeah. if you go back basketball through the 70s and 80s they really didn't play defense they really didn't so you get into the 90s and, and pat riley goes to the knicks and they've got to play against jordan so they start all this hand checking there were no hand checking rules you could put two hands on a guy and you could basically strangle him with two hands and there's nothing called that's the way it was played Hubert Davis played with the toughest group of guys in the most physical brand of basketball and excelled that we've ever seen in the history of the sport. So he's a guy that, 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 that's an overachiever and he's a guy who can, who is tough. And he's a guy to me seems like can kind of adjust to his situation. So I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, Kudos, man. I, I'm, I'm just impressed. I have, I'm nothing but impressed with him. Before we close this out, I want to go another layer here. 12 year NBA career. Then he's ESPN. He's got a great gig and he was good at that. And he was on ESPN earlier this evening and <clears throat> people got a chance to see some of the personality that does exist. Mm -hmm. uh, you joked before about the great wall of China with Carolina's coaching staff that sometimes Carolina assistants, you don't see a lot of that from them. Uh, for whatever the reason is, and hadn't seen a whole. I've chatted with Hubert several times in the last few years, and um, you know, it's not long enough to get the laughter going, a little bit of smile, but you saw that personality. So he had, I think, and as long as he would have wanted to be at ESPN, he was going to be in that job because he was really good at it. But he leaves, he takes a chance, and he goes to Roy's staff, and he works for someone 
you just talked about a bunch of demanding dudes, coaches and teammates, maybe nobody more demanding than Roy Williams. So he kind of had to reinvent himself. He was the player, the shooter, the broadcaster, the TV guy. And next thing you know, he's at the rung of the ladder, working his way up under Roy Williams and the demand that that was. I'd like to say in some respects, he was a self-made player at Carolina. A lot of doubters went to the NBA, became a self-made player in the league, was a self-made guy with a headset at ESPN, and then has become a self-made coach. What does that say about a guy who takes those chances and excels? Because he has excelled at everything so far he has attempted to do. The same thing I would say uh, that I said a while ago. You know, he 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 ta- he does take advantage of those opportunities. He's able to adjust, and he's got a toughness and perseverance about. Him. Yeah. Uh, so, and and one thing too. I think sometimes we don't get to see that guy because, like you said, I, I can imagine that Roy is a very demanding head. Probably loves his guys, but he's demanding. I've heard, you know, that that it's it, – and I don't mean this bad, but it's his program, yeah. you know, when he's the head coach. Now, there's certain coaches that treat it different ways. They give their assistant coaches a lot of autonomy. Uh, they might run practice. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Um, I know with Rick Patino, Billy Donovan used to run it, even when Rick was younger. Yeah. Uh, so you see, uh, you know, you see a lot of that. And then some coaches, they don't. You know, you're, you may be off the court, but you're in practice publicly. You know, Bobby Knight, even with him, it was funny uh, back when Bob Knight was in Indiana back in the 90s. Uh, I, uh, I was, you know, we were coaching AU and we were out recruiting players a lot. So every time night there was a high school game going on, we were in a car and always had it on AM radio station during the winter and, and would pick up the Indiana guy. Had to, we knew where Indiana was the at. Station, the station in Fort Wayne. Yeah. I used to and, want to hear that too. Yeah. Yeah. And you knew when North when North Carolina when Indiana lost, you knew because Norm Ellenberger was doing the post game press conference, his assistant coach, you know, like Coach K. I think when they led, somebody else does. So so anyway, he'll do the halftime thing. He'll have somebody else do the yeah. halftime. So, but you like I say, some have the autonomy, some don't. I was at a Tennessee practice one time when Kevin O'Neill was there and he told Lawrence Frank, Lawrence Frank said, spoke up and said something. And, and Kevin basically said, Lawrence, he said, when you get your own blanking team, then you can talk. And that was it. And well, he did two years later, he was NBA coach of the year for the Nets. So it's different situations, but I, what I'm saying is a lot of times though, coaches and his assistants, we don't get to see, that true individual as an assistant coach. And I think we'll see that looser, that personality that we saw from Hubert Davis when he was at ESPN, I think. But you're still going to see that toughness. I heard somebody say, don't think that laughing Hubert Davis is a soft Hubert Davis because it's it's not. And I believe every word of that. Yeah, like I said, you do not go from always second guest with everything that you start, end up having a ton of success without having a lot of toughness. There's there's this kind of toughness and there's this kind of toughness and this kind of toughness. He has these for sure. I think he's got enough of that right now. And, and you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what it's going to be like. I, You know, I, I enjoyed coming Roy. I was sorry to see him go for a lot of reasons, but I was also very glad to see him go. So when I say sorry, because I enjoyed covering him so much. And, and when you get to cover a Hall of Famer, it's always a treat. But I'm glad he left on his time. And I, I think right now is an exciting time for North Carolina basketball with this transition. I've got no idea how it's going to work, David. And I, and, I, and I don't even want to say this is a good hire or a bad hire. It's just the hire they made. And there's a lot of people who know what they're doing that trust this hire, in particular Roy Williams. So a lot of Carolina fans that are poo-pooing this hire, if they trusted Roy immensely a week ago, they should still trust him on this because all things considered, every move that they would have made would have been a risk. It's a risk going outside the family because you run the risk of of all that amazing culture getting kind of ruffled a little bit. And that wouldn't be a good thing. A lot of folks around there do not want that to happen. And if you stay within the family, West would have been a risk and Hubert is a bit of a risk, but it makes a lot of sense. That 
those associations that he's had, David, that's yeah. what sells it for me. Because there are very few people walking on this earth that have the kinds of associations in their profession that Hubert has had in his. And I think that that gets them off to a pretty good start, in my opinion. I'm going to commit heresy here. <laughs> but would it not been a risk somewhat if Roy would have stayed? Because especially if they would have talked him out of it. Yeah, I mean, yes. And, he, 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 you know, he said it himself. You know, he never said, I still can't coach. He said, I'm just not for the man for this job anymore. And you hate to see guys in their older age kind of hang on and they can't give it up. And, like, the last two years with that, I mean, North Carolina is basically, you put both years together, they've been, what, right around 500 maybe? We're going back to the Sweet 16 in Kansas City, 32 and 31, the last 63 games. Okay, so I, I don't think I don't think any scenario, even if he would have stayed, would have been a slam dunk. Um, although we think it would have gotten better, we don't know that. But you know, I just look at guys. I look at the the Bobby Bowdens and the Joe Paternos and those guys that just kind of. Hey, even Bear Bryant, and you look the last two to three years, I mean, Bear Bryant got out at 68, Roy 70, and I hope Roy has a lot longer retirement than the Bear had. But Bear knew, but they, there had been a little bit of drop off there. So I, I just think it was a, I, I just think it was a, uh, I don't think it was a slam dunk the way it went by, by any stretch. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes. Uh, Hubert's a very likable guy. I think Carolina's not going to have to worry about him embarrassing them, which some people say, well, at least, shoot, at least they're not going to have to worry about that because uh, you never know with some coaches that have been hired by certain places. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be really interesting to see. What at, least they didn't haul Paul, at least they didn't hire Paul Pierce. At least they didn't hire Paul Pierce. Man. <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> I'm not going there. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what he runs and what he's tweaked and and when he's comfortable, how soon he's comfortable being himself, not just in how he conducts himself, comports himself in interviews and that kind of stuff. I'm talking about when they need to run a play with his six seconds left in the half, what does he call, you know, how, what they do, uh, how, how often they run that secondary break. Is it the same secondary break? Is it the same percentage of freelance and motion and that kind of stuff? I'm looking forward to seeing that. That's going to be something a lot of us who cover the team are going to have a lot of our eyes focused on uh, the first few weeks that, that the Tar Heels play next season. I'll tell you one other thing, too, and we've not touched on this that's important. I think especially when you are the level uh, program at North Carolina is, can you sell to players that you are going to develop them, the player development? And that's huge. I know this. Every player that I talk to, well, who I cover now, when I covered Minnesota and Vanderbilt, it wasn't as big an issue as it was for rivals well, covering recruits that are getting recruited by North Carolina, by Kentucky, by Duke, by Kansas. Here's the thing that they want to know when it comes down to when when Hunter Salas made his decision, Patrick Baldwin, I think, is getting ready to make a decision. Yeah. Those, if it's not playing for his dad, it's going to be which guy can develop me. I, I guarantee you with Trevor Kills, who just committed to do, which program did I know could go in and get me ready to be a pro and be the best player I could be and get me there the quickest. So, and, and we're not necessarily talking about one and done, but I even think players – that go to North Carolina and say, hey, I'm going to stay two, three, four years. They still want to know which coach can develop them. So Hubert Davis has that track record at North Carolina as a coach. And I think the NBA pedigree, he's going to be really the first head coach that they have with that huge NBA pedigree as a player where he can sell player development from an NBA type of system for all the he when he starts throwing out Pat Riley, uh, uh, Carlisle, Larry Brown, he starts throwing out those names to recruits. That's going to have a cachet with them that that 
maybe if you hired another coach that it didn't have. And I don't think you can underestimate that when you get in recruiting. I'll leave you with this. You know, when he goes to recruit a kid who has parents, a parent or parents who have a tremendous amount of knowledge and understanding of the history of this sport, he's going to say, I played for Dean Smith, who was third generation from the man who invented the sport. I coached under Roy Williams, who was fourth generation from the man who invented the sport. That pretty much makes me the fourth slash fifth generation from the man who invented the sport. That's pretty impressive. And take Roy's approach and recruit the family. You know, you and that's one thing. Yes, that's the thing that made it different. He rec- I talked to these kids and he recruited the mom and dad. And he said, look, when I do a Zoom call, I want mom and dad and brother and sister and uncle and cousin. I want them all there. And I've heard guys say, you know, he was talking to my brother or my mom, or my, he talked to them when he talked to me. So I just think there's something with that. And then you've got all, the, all this NBA talk and all this, you know, all these experiences and all that. So he's got such a grab bag to reach out of. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting to see which direction he goes in that. You cover recruiting for us as well. So we're going to know in the next few months, we're going to get an idea of what the pitch is and what the first thing out of his mouth is and the second thing and how he handles families. And that's something that we're going to revisit in a couple months and talk about. And uh, it's going to be really interesting just to see how this whole thing unfolds. I'm kind of excited because I like new stuff. I like exciting stuff. I like having the opportunity to learn something different. And I will do that, certainly watching Hubert Davis run the North Carolina program. He's David Sisk. I'm Andrew Jones. Hubert Davis the 20th head coach in North Carolina history, the sixth since 1952. Pretty amazing stuff. And you can check out our site, tarhillillustrate.com, for all the coverage of the press conference, which is Tuesday. Jacob and I will be there. We're going to blow it out, all kinds of stuff. We'll do a video from there. Maybe David and I will hop back on later this week and go do some more stuff after we get a little bit more uh, information about how this played out. And uh, it's going to be fun. I love grinding. I love producing all kinds of content, David, and that's what we're up to. And by the way, spring football like crazy this week as well. So people say, hey, how are you liking your offseason? I'm like, ain't no offseason, man. <laughs> anyway, he's David. I'm AJ. Thanks for stopping by.